Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, May 24th, 2012, and our special guest is Elizabeth Merritt. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Steve. It's my pleasure. Really delighted that you have your webcam on. If anybody in the room experiences a slowdown in their bandwidth because of the webcam, Elizabeth can turn it off. Um, just put a note in the chat if that's happening for you, and we'll do so. But it's fun to see you right now, as long as it lasts. The Future of Education is sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project, web20labs.com, all about finding ways to help educators um, start conversations with each other, peer uh, projects. And we thank Blackboard Collaborate for the use of this room. It is the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0. We hit 67,000 members today. We have a lot of fun projects going on. If you're one of the people waiting to see the 130 chapters from the crowdsourced book, you're not alone. Our poor editor uh, is, is behind. But it is going to happen, and we are really excited about it. Lots of other fun activities coming up. Classroom20.com. If you're going to be at the ISTE conference, that's the big annual uh, educational technology conference this year being held in San Diego at the end of June. Please do visit isteunplugged.com. This is our set of shadow events that ISTE is kind enough to let us do, the crowd events. We have a lot of really fun things coming up, including the all-day conference, which is the Saturday, the all-day unconference the Saturday before, which is free. You don't even need to be registered for ISTE to attend. And we're going to have a Saturday night after party which is going to be a blast. So anyway, lots of fun, lots of activities being planned. It's theunplugged.com. If you missed the Social Learning Summit, uh, all 73 sessions were recorded. Thanks to Discovery Education for sponsoring that event all around social media and learning. Uh, go to sociallearningsummit.com or classroom20.com and look for the link. Coming up this fall, the Future of Libraries Conference and the Global Education Conference. Both of these conferences have posted their call for proposals and calls for volunteers and the advisory board. So uh, please do uh, look for those, library20.com or globaleducationconference.com. And then we've got lots of other fun events coming up. I won't spoil them now, but we're, we're making plans for lots of fun, including, I'll tease you here, a Learning 2.0 conference in August for the Department of Ed all around the changes to teaching and learning because of the internet. Coming up next week, Brian Alexander visits uh, with us. Then uh, Khalid Smith and his wife are going to come on the show to talk about Startup Weekend EDU. Um, you can see the rest of the schedule there. Um, nothing nothing new. Uh, John Idelson, we had to change his session to July 19th. So if you were looking for that, it was supposed to be this past Tuesday. But it's going to be on the 19th of July. If you've missed any of our shows, they are all recorded. They're in the full Collaborate version and in an MP3 format. Mark Bauerlein came on the show again, and that was so terrific. Uh, his new book, The Digital Divide, a look at different perspectives on the impact of the internet on our culture. Highly recommended an anthology of essays. I just loved it. Mark had previously written a book called The Dumbest Generation, and he's well-tempered now, and it's a much more thoughtful conversation. But I really enjoyed having him on the show. Keith Devlin from Stanford. The NPR math guy was on. That was lots of fun. Buffy Hamilton and Kristen Fontichiaro about um, libraries. Larry Johnson gave us the first look at the new uh, K-12 Horizon report. Anyway, lots, lots up there. Hope they, hope there's something that you would, you will enjoy. And I'm going to give you all permissions to indicate where you are on the map. You're going to see some icons to the left. You're looking for the star icon, the second one down. Double click on that, and then click on the map. And give us a shout out. Let us know the time and the temperature of where you are. I always love the international flavor here. I'm guessing that's Alan there. And some in Australia, Shanghai. What a lot of fun. Someone in Portugal or Spain? Italy? India? Elizabeth, you've drawn a good international crowd tonight. Yay. Lots of fun. Glad to see all of you. 
I'm actually not in my hometown right now, Steve. I work out of Washington, D.C., but right now I am very kindly being hosted by the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, California. How fun. Has the weather been nice? I don't know. We've been socked inside all day trying to envision the future. <laughs> it's been 70 degrees and air conditioned, I would imagine. Yeah, cool enough in the museum. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. There are people here from the Institute for the Future and the Long Now Foundation, as well as the Yerba Buena staff and some interesting people from the local universities. So I'm all primed to look a few decades ahead. Wow, what a great group. That must have been lots of fun. Well, I said a few decades, but you know the Long Now Foundation is building the 10,000-year clock, so they have a longer ambition. Well, that's great. Well, we're sure glad that you're taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us. Thank you, and thank those of you who are participating. We're really delighted to have you here. So um, you and I met in Austin at the Horizon Report 10th anniversary meeting, and I've just really been looking forward to this conversation around museums. So tell us a little bit about the Center for the Future of Museums. Sure, Steve. The Center for the Future of Museums came about because our parent organization, we're an initiative of the American Association of Museums, celebrated its 100th birthday in 2006. And on the occasion of its 100th birthday, uh, the Board of Trustees said to the staff, what could we do that would be most helpful to lead museums into the next century? And the staff, being a bunch of smart asses, came back and said, well, we don't know because we don't know what the next century is going to be like, do we? And the board turned that back into a challenge. They threw at the staff saying, well, go figure it out. So out of that interchange came the idea to have a think tank, an idea lab, that was trying to forecast the future of global society, the U.S. society, with an emphasis on what role museums can play in helping their communities prepare for that, those potential futures and to turn themselves into institutions that will thrive under a variety of conditions. It's, uh, in reading your report on museums and the future of education, it felt very much to me like this is kind of a peril slash promise moment. There's this sense both of you know incredible opportunity to make a difference as our thinking about education changes, but also the peril of maybe not being relevant, or even the demographic issues that you're facing with regard to museums. Is that a fair assessment, that, there, that there's this duality? It is, though frankly, I think the promise is greater than the peril. Right now, when it comes to education, the frustration that museums have is that in the U.S., I'm being cognizant that I'm speaking to an international audience here, we're often seen as nice but not necessary. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S., if you came up to them on the street and said, hey, you know, what do you think about museums? Aren't we great educational institutions? They'd look at you blankly and say, educational? Museums are educational institutions? Uh, you're not a school. You're not a university. So we very much see that as central to our mission. And we see all the fabulous things we do, the tremendous amount of money and time we spend on programming for schools, on teacher training, and on, of course, on informal learning experiences, which is what we excel at. But we're marginalized in the political and popular perception of education. So we have a long way to go even to get the role we're playing now to be appreciated. Okay, the bad news for the U.S. is, as I'm sure you've discussed a lot on this show, there are a lot of indications that the current educational era, uh, the era that we've been in for over 100 years of traditional factory-style learning with teachers being instructors and kids being regimented by age and taken through a series of classes and graduating with a diploma and going off into the workforce, may be destabilizing to the point where it's ready to collapse and be replaced by a new educational era, one that might be characterized by self-directed learning, distributed learning, and the sorts of techniques and 21st century skills that are more characterized by the informal learning environment that museums have gotten so good at. So if this is true, if we're facing a potential, a perhaps likely future in which the educational system in the U.S. is on the cusp of transformative change, but now is the time to say, what is the central role museums could play in helping reshape the education and the learning environment in the U.S. into something that's even better, something that's really going to serve our kids as they go into the 21st century? So we're going to drill down on those specific attributes of museum learning that I think are so essential here. But I have to tell you, I hear an echo of the same conversation in the library world 
which yes. is the public perception of the role of libraries is far different than the potential. So are you facing some of the same budget cut issues as well as the perception issues? Yes and no. Libraries have a unique challenge in that the vast majority of them are public in the sense of being government funded and government run uh, in one way or another. And so with the severe financial cuts in government services right now, libraries are taking a huge hit. On the other hand, libraries are already being seen as essential resources in their communities because in these economic hard times they're stepping up and playing the role of a community service place where people go to use the internet to look for jobs, where people go for some additional training with librarians, where people go to buff their resumes or make them look good when they're looking for a job. So the strains on libraries during the economic climate is also turning out to be a great occasion for them to strut their stuff and say, look, in hard times people turn to us. You shouldn't cut our funding because now we're needed more than ever in this essential role we're playing, which may not necessarily be lending books notice, which is interesting. They're really evolving to figure out what their role in the future is. Museums have a lot of threats to our funding, but museum funding is much more heavily individual donations and, and private philanthropy. Uh, earned income, of which libraries usually have very little. Um, uh, most private nonprofit museums have endowments, small or big, and so they often have a significant chunk of change coming from the earnings on their endowment. And then a small percent, maybe around 20% on average of their funding, might be state or local or a little bit of federal funding. Uh, all of those sources of income are under threat. But I don't think there's a direct connection, as with libraries, between are saying, uh, oh, you should give us more money because we're providing services that directly help people survive this financial crisis. We have a potentially much deeper and more transformative role, but we also have a bigger job in proving what that is. Uh, it's about inspiration. It's about creativity. It's about helping people find their center, as well as being opportunities for them to pursue their passions and learn new skills. It's not as simple as we can help you find a job. So why don't, um, tell us how you define a museum. Uh, it's, it's just to me like I'm not, I'm not even sure I could really give a good definition of, uh, of what constitutes a museum and what would not constitute a museum. Well, uh, this is, uh, you would start with the hard questions. Um, AEM has very carefully never defined museum. And if you go to the Institute of Museum and Library Services website, you'll see that they have eligibility criteria for what museums can be funded by the federal government. If you go to the accreditation program that's run by AAM, we have eligibility criteria for who can become accredited. But nobody's biting the bullet and, says, and saying, this is the boundary that defines what a museum. And if you have all these characteristics, you're inside the tent. And if you have even missing one of those characteristics, you're outside. It's a lot messier than that. I'm, I'm a biologist by training. And I like to say that it's sort of like trying to learn what a species looks like. If, you, if you're trying to identify a species and you're a taxonomist, you look at the type of specimen. It's the first one that was collected, so a type specimen of the blue jay or an elephant. And the actual specimen you're looking at might look really different. It might be a fairly different color. It may be much bigger or much smaller. It might have weird little anatomical variations. But you can tell that they're really close family. And short of doing a genetic test, that's your best bet, is to look at a whole bunch of blue jays to learn what a blue jay looks like. And I think that's the answer for the US. You can't define a museum. You look at a whole bunch of museums, and you learn the range of all the different things they can look at. Uh, when we talk about museums in the American Association of Museums, we mean zoos. We mean botanic gardens. So you can say, oh, I get it. It's not only dead stuff. It's also living stuff. Well, but it's not even always stuff, because you have children's museums, many of which don't collect objects. You have science centers, which, when they're interpreting real things, those real things are physical phenomena, like gravity and electromagnetism. So they may be using objects, but they're using objects to help you visualize those invisible forces. So people start getting into these arguments about, well, oh, it's about the experience. It's usually about the real thing. But I keep going back to the intuitive answer that people know a museum when they see it. And it, it doesn't always mean even being a nonprofit in the US. It's a, a place you go to have an experience, often with real stuff, but an experience that is curated. It's created consciously to 
give you some sort of experience that's often educational, sometimes just inspirational. It's that vague and yet, and yet that clear. Uh, you take a person into an environment and I bet most people would be able to say to you, this is a theme park, no, that's a museum. This is definitely a museum, no, that's a library. This is a museum, that's a university. But you try and put it down on paper and it becomes really fuzzy. Well, we'll leave it at that and see how we do. But, uh, but I, uh, you know, I was sort of curious. I was, I was, as I was comparing libraries and museums, I was sort of intrigued by the fact that we have libraries in schools, but typically we don't have a museum in a school, and how a museum feels to me like it's a little bit more learner-centered than a library. I was, I was interesting to try and kind of figure out the the differences. Um, in the paper, you talk about. Uh, what you think the sort of key role that museums will play in the new educational landscape. And you make a differentiation between incremental change and disruptive change. That incremental mm -hmm. change happens within an era and disruptive change is actually what sort of shifts you from one era to the other. I would also imagine there's yeah. a little bit of a buffer space between, right? I mean, there's no clean break and an immediate adoption of a new era. My, my guess is there are years or decades of sort of trying to figure out what the, what the next thing is. But if we assume that we're moving from one era to another, and this is disruptive and not incremental change, what is it you feel uh, makes, uh, why is it you feel like libraries are, are so well positioned to make a really big difference here? I think, first of all, because historically, Frankly, libraries were always a little more democratic in the sense that they had a very broad reach into their community. Museums have always aspired to be very accessible, to have deep penetration into all sorts of communities. The fact is, and this is one of the demographic challenges we face, is when you look at the facts, overall, museums as a whole, and this, may vary, this varies from museum to museum, but as a whole, museums are serving a dispropor disproportionately affluent, well-educated Caucasian audiences. And no matter how much we have tried over the past few decades to change that, it hasn't, we don't think, been a big shift. And this isn't a country that's going to be majority minority by 2040. So I think part of it is the fact that libraries have already inserted themselves more deeply into a demographically diverse um, America. I think the other thing, frankly, and this gets interesting, is libraries have always been less intimidating in many ways. And this may be connected to what I just said about them uh, attracting a broader audience. Libraries are often low key, and setting aside the Carnegie libraries where you walk up the big marble steps and you have the big marble columns and you go into the beautiful reading room. A lot of community libraries, it's just a place. You walk in, it has ratty carpeting like your living room. You sit down on the armchair, you're like your living room. There's somebody there who's really helpful who comes up and says, you know, can I help you with something? Museums, bless them, have spent a lot of time and money being beautiful and being imposing. But the flip side of that is they're often a little off-putting and frankly, they're often a little uncomfortable. So yeah, you have your low-key community museums that are, are not intimidating where people go to hang out. But for every one of those, there are a lot more museums trying to raise a few million dollars to build the great, beautiful building that indeed will be a beautiful piece of sculpture and architecture, but then may look like a place that people are a little afraid to come into. You know, when you talk about, when in the paper you talk about museums being a place of hands-on or application, and uh, it was funny because the juxtaposition for me was I had just been at Maker Fair, which is just south of where you are now in San Mateo, and I was thinking about is there a difference between a maker space and hands-on? Because a lot of the descriptions that are given for museums involve kind of hands-on activities, but they're not necessarily constructing activities as much as maybe sort of replicating or participating physically in something that's still um, more of a top-down learning experience. Uh, have you seen examples of libraries as make, or, sorry, museums as maker spaces that are, are you familiar with the Maker Fair and that uh, kind of stuff? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, a lot of museums are beginning to incorporate maker spaces in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., in my backyard, which is, you know, the Smithsonian, the most traditional traditional museums, uh, the very old established big places. Uh, the Hirshhorn has Art Lab Plus, which is a makerspace for teens that basically says, here are all these fabulous audiovisual resources. What do you want to do with them? We'll provide the training and backup to help you do these projects and make this art. 
And it not only says, you know, go make your little art, it mainstreams it into the museum. It says, okay, here's your challenge. If you do this material and it becomes part of an exhibit, you do these videos and we're going to share them with the museum audience. Um, let's see, where was I recently? I've been traveling too much, but I just was at a museum that had inaugurated a new maker space for the community, which was providing things like 3D printers where people can come in and use them and providing other forms of fabrication. So I really think that that's something that's catching on as museums realize that people don't want to just do and be consumers of physical culture. They want to be makers. They want to be doers as well. So they use the museum as a source of inspiration, and then they get their hands dirty and figure out what they can do themselves. So Carol's asking a question in the chat. And Carol, we will get to this, this the whole question of bringing the museums to schools. Um, and, and mobile museums. But um, before we get there, uh, one of the things you say, uh, Elizabeth, is that museums provide sort of an early glimpse into the future. And you identify these core skills that you think are part of kind of the new learning environment and ways in which museums kind of uniquely do this already. And I thought it might be kind of fun to go through those so you can at least explain them. So they're critical thinking, synthesizing, synthesizing information, applying lessons to the real world, innovation and creativity, teamwork and collaboration. And I added one, which you mentioned, but I'm not sure is in the original list, of in inspiration or inspiring. So tell us oh, how yeah. museums do a good job with critical thinking. Well, for example, museums are often doing programming, where they present challenges rather than solutions. A lot of museums, and this is where our strength is in informal experiential learning, don't teach fact. They don't say, just here are the dates, here's the stuff, go memorize it. They say, get your, get your hands dirty. Here's the background, you figure it out. So for example, um, the co-author of the paper that you mentioned, Scott Kratz at the National Building Museum, co-authored uh, Museums in the Future of Education with me. And the National Building Museum excels at this. So they don't sit down and say, let's teach you engineering. We're going to teach you the principles of weight distribution and construction and materials. They say, here's a bunch of stuff, build a bridge figure it out. What are the important points? Uh, what are the kinds of shapes that, that bear weight in an effective way, which are the ones that don't? So by providing these opportunities for experimentation, they encourage people to formulate hypotheses and test them out and work with other kids or adults to um, explore their thoughts and not just take somebody else's word for it. I love that description of the National Building Museum. And one of the things that I thought of as I was reading it was, there are probably no grades. Does that I mean, do you think that makes a difference? Yes. I mean, as an interest driven, without actually any kind of worry about uh, some formal assessment? Well, I've heard a lot of back and forth argumentation on this. And I know one of the people in our chat rooms who's in on this, uh, this session is Shauna Edson from DC. Hi, Shauna. She is somebody who was unschooled. She did a blog post and a video for the Center for the Future Museums on that recently. So Shauna grew up in an educational system of her own making with no testing and no grades. And I, I think she's an exemplar of the fact that this kind of no stress, no assessment environment can work for some kids. I have friends who are teachers who argue very strenuously that they know students who totally wouldn't excel without the stress and challenge of, of making a grade and improving their grade. But I think it's really important that even if part of the educational or learning system has that kind of grading and feedback, that there's an area to explore where there isn't that kind of pressure and judgment, where the only feedback is your feeling of having fun and knowing that you can try it out and fail. I think if I had to criticize the entire American learning system and even our work environment, the first thing I'd pick on in the fact is that we create systems where we develop a fear of failure. And unless people are unafraid to fail and actually understand the benefits of failure, we're not going to have a truly creative and innovative society. I think one of the important things about museums is quite often we succeed in creating an environment where you don't feel wrong, you don't feel dumb, you just feel encouraged to explore. I think when we get it wrong is if we get on our high horses and send a signal that visitors are dumb, we know more than you do, and we're not even going to tell you how to get it right. It's sort of some sort of secret club where if you know the key, you'll understand these paintings. And if you don't, then you can just read the labels and maybe hope you'll understand what people are saying with all these fancy words they don't understand, that they don't explain. So I think that the, the no-grade experiential uh, 
environment that museums can construct is, is a very important source of getting kids all fired up to become their own explorers and their own teachers, like Shona did, so that they get passionate about a subject and decide they want to be an astrophysicist or decide they want to be a biologist. And that's the kind of knowledge they'll then seek out and pursue for themselves on top of whatever they're getting in the formal education system. Your core skills obviously kind of overlap. The next one is synthesizing information. And the example you use in the paper is the DC Museum. It feels like it probably fits very well with what you've just described. But do you want to talk a little bit about what, what they do at the museum that uh, relates to synthesizing information? I think that's a really good example of how one of the things museums can help people do right now is to filter, learn how to filter and synthesize information. Right now, we're in an era where there is no deficit of stuff and no deficit of information. You're overwhelmed by the amount of stuff you can find on the web. You can Google anything, but do you know how to sort through the search results? You can find YouTube videos, but do you know which ones you're actually going to want to look at and believe? You can find tons of news, even if you're not paying anybody to deliver it to you, but you know which ones are reputable and whether they're doing good research. I think, and you're right, it, this does relate to critical thinking. One of the things that museums, and in the museum's case, a journalism museum uniquely can do, is to help people be intelligent consumers of information. What are trusted sources? What do you mean by trusted? How do you weigh who did the research and the slant they're bringing to the writing? And how do you bring together all these different sources of information that are available now, whether it's uh, traditional journalism, whether it's blogs, whether it's video, and compare and bring together what you're taking in to form your worldview and make decisions. I think they've done a really good job because they're coming at it from the point of view of providers of news. And they really know what goes into putting this together. I think it's really interesting that they've flipped it around and also said, well, let's start educating consumers of the news to be better consumers. I, I can't think of another example of somebody doing that. Yeah, that was really fun. OK, then it's applying lessons to the real world. And your example is the San Francisco Exploratorium. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine you've visited there this trip. But certainly <laughs> anybody who's been there knows it's quite unique. And you, and you talk specifically about the dissection of uh, cow eyeballs. Yes, just because we wanted something in the paper that was really gross. So you can go look at the video online if you want to gross yourself out at lunch. Well, I think, and let's talk for a moment here about really young kids. Because I think one of the challenges is, I think, and now I'm just speaking entirely from personal experience and opinion, not from any knowledge of research, but maybe some of you in the audience can weigh in and tell me if I'm right, that there's a window in which a child becomes inspired about what they want to do in life. And they get the boundaries of their conceptions about what those things are. I could grow up to be a fireman. I could grow up to be a nurse. And uh, there may be constraints in their own head if there's gender bias in their environment, oh, but women don't grow up to be mathematicians, or women don't grow up to be scientists, or it may just be that there are certain professionals, professions like working in a museum, but they don't know really exist, so they can't conceive of them. So um, this is an example where I think demonstrating real world applicability of our subject matter can help kids realize what they could do, um, what they could do with their lives. So the fact that they could be working artists, the fact that they could grow up to be scientists, the fact that they could grow up to actually do the things that creators of materials in museums um, are doing to create that stuff. So uh, how, how do museums manifest innovation and creativity? Well, I think that that's what they do par excellence. Um, sometimes it's really obvious, as in art museums, where the material that we're exhibiting is the product of creativity. Some of it is the material culture that people may not realize it, but it had to get invented by someone. And that's why in the paper we cite the example of the Henry Ford Academy. I think the Henry Ford is a really brilliant museum to cite because Give an example of how looking at these 21st century skills can help museums reinvent their missions and be more relevant to a broader audience. There are a lot of history museums out there right now that frankly aren't doing so great on attendance. There aren't a lot of people who want to go and learn history and look at the stuff. The Henry Ford 
realized we're not just about Henry Ford, the guy. We're not just about cars. We're about the process of inventing things and making things. We're about innovation. And they started figuring out how can we really use that theme to teach kids about innovation? How can we expose them to geniuses like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and people who have made things that they know of and are important to them and say, you can do this too. Things get created. They don't just magically arise. And you can start thinking about how you can be an inventor and creator. So I think part of it, again, is expanding kids' thinking so that they know this is something they can do and show them, show them a lot of inspiring examples. Um, yep, yeah, sorry. So Deborah, Deborah in the chat is asking, uh, she says it's a great museum, but what do they offer to schools? Isn't there a Henry Ford Academy, which is a partnership of the company, nonprofit museum, and a public school? That's only one, actually. I think the Henry Ford is running like four schools now. They're in a major initiative with the Detroit, the greater Detroit school system. And of course, the Detroit is, the school system is in a tremendously bad way. You talk about financial distress to try and figure out a lot of different ways to partner between the museums, the school systems, and other resources in the community to create viable educational experiences in an educational environment that otherwise has got severe challenges. So that specific uh, museum is a really good example of a museum aggressively devoting significant resources to inserting itself into the traditional school system. Uh, and there are others doing it in creative ways. Um, for example, the De Cordova Museum, Sculpture Park and Museum in Massachusetts, Lincoln, Massachusetts, had partnered for a long time with a local progressive preschool. And they said, well, you know, let's try and have a little co closer partnership. And they brought one of the preschool classes into the museum, basically, to live in the museum. That worked so well, they basically said, let's just merge. Let's have the preschool be the museum. And I don't just mean it's like on the museum grounds or there's a designated room. The kids going to preschool spend their day in the museum. Think what a great experience that is for a preschooler. Those kids are all going to grow up loving museums and feeling like they're theirs because that was their environment for early learning. I, I really loved those examples, and I, you know, I kind of felt the brilliance of them. You've talked about Art Lab Plus, and in the in the paper, it's in the context of teamwork and collaboration, um, mm -hmm. which is, I think, which is sort of your final point. Although I, I believe actually that sort of inspiration point may be um, sort of the summing up of all of that. But um, are, are there other examples of how um, museums have done a good job sort of manifesting or showing early on the learning as teamwork and collaboration? I think they do both. And I want to back up. I want to back up a moment because I want to point out this framework that we're working with here. These critical skills are not something that I invented or Scott Krauts invented. These are actually a framework that has been adopted broadly by the learning community and particularly by the museum community. The Institute of Museum and Library Services took the 21st Century Skills Framework and, and published a, a pretty definitive document saying here's how they can match up to what museums do. But in terms of of collaboration, I think that museums are still nurturing the sort of traditional individual creativity, the individual brilliant artist, the individual scientist pursuing their monomaniacal passion. But they're also great environments for letting people work together and showing how increasingly even those traditionally solitary pursuits are becoming relentlessly social and collaborative in this new world. So for example, art is much more often becoming collaborative with people doing mashups and collaborations in ways that are vastly comp complicating attribution and copyright. So it drives some, some curators and rights managers nuts. But that's the artistic environment we live in. And things like Art Lab Plus um, and the Future Curators Team Program at the Albright Knox give learners a chance to begin collaborating in those joint environments. This is even having, happening in science. More and more scientific research is being done in a massively collaborative way as people explore metadata or as researchers around the world um, work virtually in groups to tackle similar projects uh, and to tackle problems together. So when museums do things like citizen science and say, let's all tackle this problem together, you can volunteer to work little bits of the problem and contribute real data, they're 
really just drawing learners, kids or adults, into a process that's taking place in the professional scientific environment. They're just opening up the doors to everybody else as well. I'm trying to remember where the story was. It was either in this paper or on your website uh, where, where someone says, you know, I decided in a museum that I was going to become such and such. Uh, do you feel like museums do that uniquely? I don't know if they do it uniquely because they're my field, so those are the stories I know. I do know they do it tremendously effectively over and over again, and we've begun collecting those stories. I think you might be remembering an interview that I did um, with the gentleman who is Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is the director of the Rose Center for Air and Space at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He's an astrophysicist. He's amazing. He's a PhD astrophysicist who does research and blogs and treats and writes popular books and runs a huge museum division. So I don't know why he sleeps in there. And I, he's a dad as well. But I believe that he told the story that his parents um, may relentlessly took him to museums as a little kid and he had this transformative experience of realizing he wanted to grow up to be an astronomer. And I know lots of people who can tell me their stories of remembering standing in front of the dinosaur and realizing they wanted to be a paleontologist or being in an art museum and, and realizing that they wanted to grow up to do art. So I think that source of inspiration, especially for fields where people are not broadly exposed to them in the public school system or outside of museums, is really important. We've talked a lot in the show in the last few months about uh, the learner as agent and kind of this idea of uh, the learner be, being someone who makes a choice about what they want to learn and, and, and growing and developing in that agency as they get older. And it feels like library, I mean, museums really have a, have a unique role to play there for uh, individuals becoming captivated and passionate about something. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a case study. I'm a museum brat. I grew up in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, just up the bluffs from University Circle, which is the area that has all of the greatest Cleveland museums, at least when I was growing up. So it has the Art Museum, and it has the um, Botanical Center now, and it has the Natural History Museum and the Historical Society. And I would ride my bicycle down and volunteer in the Natural History Museum. And that really inspired me to follow my own passion for learning outside of school about animals, about natural history, and to go on and get a graduate degree in zoology. I think that the two most important things museums can do is to inspire people with a love of something that they want to pursue on their own, and then provide the resources for them to pursue it by having those resources broadly available and providing a way to support their use. Um, training people how to use them, giving people opportunities to volunteer physically or virtually, giving people a chance to learn about other opportunities to get involved in understanding what it takes to take the next step in doing that either more deeply as an amateur or doing it professionally. So we really can be the entree to whole new worlds. It occurs to me that there is something very magical about the fact that museums tend to be kind of subject specific and the people who work at them passionately interested in that subject. Whereas we typically, you know, I'll, I'll often ask a school teacher, you know, what are you passionate about? And, the, and sometimes the answer will unfortunately be, I, I don't really remember, I don't know, I'm kind of a cog in this larger wheel. Mm -hmm. But it does feel as though those who work at museums are, are sort of uniquely interested in the subject area. Yeah, and I think that kids tend to self-select uh, from those interests very early on. I think that one of the biggest weaknesses I see right now in the bridge, given that we're living in the traditional existing educational era and we haven't transitioned to a new one yet, I think one of the things you may have seen in the papers, I point out that the statistics line up in a strangely symmetrical way. That if you're just looking at the average, you look at the number of school visits in the U.S., you look at the number of K through 12 students enrolled in the U.S. and it, it works out that every kid in the U.S. gets on average one visit to a museum a year, which is great, I guess, and that they're all getting exposed to a museum once a year, some of them more, maybe some of them not at all, but it's not enough to really be transformative. Um, I'm hoping their families are bringing them back. I'm hoping they'll come on their own. But how can we make sure that they're having enough time in the museum to really take advantage of those resources and let it have that kind of impact on them. 
Well, so the paper goes on to make some recommendations, and um, I, I think that's, that's sort of a core part of, of what you're doing here, sort of looking at the future, looking at how museums are kind of uniquely manifest uh, potential in these skill areas, and then you make some recommendations. And the first is to scale up the educational resources and skills provided by museums via online access. So uh, where do you see that going? Well, I think the good news is that that's an area where museums are investing so many resources right now that it's, it's going to happen at an unprecedented pace. The fact is we only, we only know getting an accurate count of the muse how many museums are in the U.S. We're guessing pending the results of a formal survey that we're working on with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, that it's maybe about 27,000. We're not going to suddenly have 270,000 museums in the U.S. This is another jump that libraries have on us. There are way more libraries than our museums. So absent the ability to suddenly make there be more museums so that it's easier for people to get to one, uh, and, and we'd be able to absorb the capacity of people if they suddenly were vastly more motivated to come, I think that what we can do is say, we're sitting on so many fabulous resources that are just pre-adapted to be available virtually. Um, museums are working really hard to digitize their databases, digitize their images, as well as creating really cool and, in, and engaging frameworks on the web for people to access them, whether it's something like the Tech Museum of Innovation, which creates a whole virtual, safe virtual world for kids to talk to a female scientist named Polly Positron and try little experiments, whether it's something like Google, outside museums, saying, hey, use our resources to upload your art so that you have the, the worldwide Google Art Project where people can look at digital images of museums online if they're in the virtual worlds that can actually tour through the corridors of some museums in the world, and they can get really up close and personal with uh, high resolution digital images of some of the greatest artwork. I think the challenge is, frankly, not the speed at which museums are digitizing their resources and making them available, it's helping people find them. And that's where I'm really interested in finding um, other groups, other companies, and many of these are digital startups, that are trying to specialize in aggregating and indexing learning resources, whether they're in museums or someplace else. So I think I referenced in the paper one called Shroop that is, seems to be primarily oriented at history resources, but it does a bit of other things as well, where if you're a student saying, you know, I'm trying to learn about colonial history, it will give you some little capsule facts and say, here's some good places to go for more information, including a lot of links to museums with some of the really cool, deep content that they've created uh, about art or history or science. So it's more that we need an integrated online environment where anybody who's interested in the topic can find the stuff that's out there, but it's really hard to dig up and unite right now. That's kind of the metadata level, right? Yeah. It's sort of making sure that, in, that you are in, uh, you have the structures in place for people to find things at the highest level to drill down. Right. Um, You've, you've talked about museums that, that have schools associated with them or even inside of them. Mm -hmm. What about um, getting museums out to schools, like the, this kind of mobile exhibit? Um, what are things that you think need to be done there? I'd actually push past that, Steve. Um, I think it's not so much about getting museums out to schools. This is for decades. Museums have had the school kits that get rented out. or interpreters who make the trek to the schools and do the program at the school. And again, it's kind of limiting. It fits into the schedule. It's resource dependent on transportation and the people to get there and booking it. It's all good. I'm not saying it's bad. It's great and it will keep happening, but I don't think that's ever going to be revolutionarily bigger. I think that the change there is going to be about museums going out into the world, period. I think that one of the things that um, ubiquitous mobile handheld devices like my little smartphone and the vast number of digital resources we're putting on the web and the speed of advancing technology for things like augmented reality means that museums are realizing they don't have to exist just within the four walls of the building. They can curate and interpret and index stuff 
that's anywhere in the world or anywhere out in the neighborhood. So that in effect, a history museum can say, our city is our history museum. Let me put in your hand a guide that you can use to find the historical information and photographs and things that you can do to investigate it. And part of that investigation might be inside the museum, and part of it might be in the street outside your house, and part of it may be in the school if you choose to access it there. So I don't think it's so much about thinking about porting little pieces of the museum into a physical school, physical to physical, as starting to think beyond the physical to making these resources integrated into the environment overall. I love that. Uh, I also really loved your vision of museums becoming more involved in teacher training. Um, mm -hmm. Not just the content piece, but, but actually on process and experiential learning. Why is it you feel so strongly that there, there's value there? I think that a lot of the frustration, and again, now I'm going to step out and be very clear that I'm not an expert in this area, but from what I'm reading, a lot of the frustration with the current system where we're bumping up against our limitations are that traditional forms of teaching only get you so far. And yes, we've refined it in some ways. You know, you have Khan Academy showing that for some kids at least, watching a video at their own speed and repeating it if they need to and then self-testing to level up is more effective than just taking a class from lecturing and getting tested at, uh, in a pop quiz. Um, we've shown, you know, we've, we've kit schools that certain forms of like, memorization and recitation work for certain kids. And all that's great. But the fact is what museums have always known and always been really good at are the exact opposite spend end of the spectrum, the informal learning environments that are more open-ended and playful, and as we said at the beginning, have less pressure. How do you create these environments? And it takes a good deal of skill and engineering and curation that encourage people to explore, that lead them instead of hammering them over the head. That's what museums have spent a century getting really good at. And that's the kind of environment that really might work for some other kids that would thrive because they have the interest, but the old structures and, and drilling and testing are not the way to bring out their innate passion and talent. So I think that whatever kind of school system we have in the future, you know, whatever a school system looks like in the future, it is going to learn from and port in a lot of that skill that we've developed in informal learning environments like museums and make it part of the mainstream. I'm delighted that you're so bullish on the role of museums and their potential for informing learning. I fear that we're this is going to be a lot messier than we would like this transition to be from one era to the next. But I, I really appreciate the perspective. We're going to switch to Q&A. And mm -hmm. uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask Elizabeth, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, I have some additional topics I'll bring up if we if we get to a silent point. But please, if I if you put something in the chat that was a question and I missed it, please just put it in again. The chat flies by very quickly. Um, and to raise your hand, it's the third icon over in the participant window. It's just a, a hand. And if you hover over, we'll say raise hand and we'll give you the mic. While we're waiting for our first question, uh, augmented reality, gaming, handheld devices, w where do you see some really fun stuff happening here? Oh gosh, there's so much. Okay, augmented reality. One of the things that I think I've always been frustrated with as a museum person is I get to touch the stuff. I can put on my little white gloves and pick it up and look underneath and look inside, and nobody else got to. And I think one of the great things about augmented reality is it's letting other people do that as much as they're going to be able to. It lets you pick up and manipulate the object. It lets you look inside and underneath and take a really close look. Until we get a really good haptic interface, I think it's going to be the closest experience people have to being um, the owner of the object and being able to play around with it. So that's one really good one. So Stephanie has raised her hand. Stephanie, to turn your mic on, you click on the talk button, which is underneath the picture of Elizabeth. And it's an on-off switch. Go ahead and click that on, and we'll see if you're microphone comes on. Hello, can everyone hear me? Hi, Stephanie. Can can I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. I have to admit, I've jumped in and out a bit because I have to go and take an education session at the moment. I'm an education officer at a museum in Australia. Yeah, um, which museum? I have to ask, which museum? Uh, Sovereign Hill in Ballarat. Fabulous. Victoria. Yeah, it's an outdoor museum. Uh, but what I'm interested in is the, uh, I've come from a teaching 
background and moved into education. But what I'm interested in is, is how we sort of, uh, how we better communicate with schools to help them understand the potential of museums. Because I'm, I feel like I'm often faced with schools that, that don't understand what we can give them and don't tap into us and when there's a lot of opportunities for us to help and support and we've been doing a lot of things with you know blogging for professional development yes. teachers and things like yes. that but we're still finding it hard to get into the schools and, and reach them so I'm just wondering um, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, one thing I don't know is how what I say in the U.S. might uh, apply to Australia. I know that a lot of the work we're doing in CFM gets picked up by our Australian colleagues and, and does translate well. But in the U.S., one thing we're looking at, well, two things we're looking at. First of all, um, we actually learn, always learn about the future from the past. We dug through the AEM um, archives and we found that there was a publication that we had done some, oh gosh, I think it was 30 years ago, that was basically an educator's guide to using a museum. And it was an overview of all of these things that you could do in a museum and how you could access the resources and the kinds of things you might find. And we, we've looked at that recently and said, gosh, it would be really great to have the 21st century version of that that was a ubiquitous web resource and, and try and get it to go viral so the teachers were telling other teachers, oh, you should go look at this. It could give you some really good ideas. The other thing is you mentioned teacher training. I think that's tremendously important. If, if museums were one of the major centers of continued education credits for teachers, first of all, it's great for the teachers because it's a fun, it's a fun learning environment. It's a good experience for them. It's an inspirational and gets them away from their usual environment and the daily grind. And also, even if it's not specifically what's being taught to them, it puts them in an environment where they become aware of the educational resources in the museum and they might see it in a way that they hadn't before. So I think those are two very good ways. The third way that we want to tackle it in the U.S. through the American Association of Museums is raising the profile of museums as educational resources more generally with policymakers and the public in general by creating a series of case studies um, stories that we can tell in a lot of, lot of different ways, whether they're in blog posts, whether they're in videos, so that there's more general exposure that people have to what happens in museums and the educational role that they are playing right now if the school chooses to take advantage of it. Thanks for that question, Stephanie. Uh, I think I met Stephanie when we did a teacher 2.0 training in Australia. It's the same, same person. Um, Durf asks, is it practical to think about joining museums with libraries and have them in the same place? I actually, uh, again, I'm going to go one better on that. Did anybody ever say it would be good to mash up a, a telephone and a camera? <laughs> I have a little video on the web you can find if you go looking that's called The Campaign Against Nouns. Because you know this is a calendar, it's a book, it's a uh, restaurant review guide, it's a camera, it's a video phone. Uh, it's actually a pretty terrible phone when it comes down to that, but it's a great web browser. I really think there's going to be a blurring of boundaries of cultural institutions in general in the future. And I think, I don't know what, what things are going to end up being called, but I think it's going to be very common to find elements of what we would consider to be a museum and a theater and a maybe even a convention center and a library and a school in different combinations in public institutions with varying uh, amounts of the characteristics of their various parents. So. And I think that they're starting to converge already. I've seen many museums that have begun to have libraries that used to be traditional research libraries for the museum staff that are now open to the public and getting used by people who are really thrilled to have access to these specialized resources. I see libraries that are starting to, and they've always done this again, it's not a new thing, it's just a matter of frequency, starting to do increasingly sophisticated object-based exhibits in the library to incorporate museum elements. And I'm starting to see that both institutions, for example, museums and libraries, are exploring new things like maker spaces, so that they're creating resources that are similar in one environment than the other. So yeah, I think they're going to converge in their identities in the future. So someone raised their hand and they've since lowered it. If you, if you intended to raise your hand, please feel free to raise it again. I'm glad to give you the mic. Um, if I've missed the question in the chat, again, I apologize. Just draw it to my attention. Um, Elizabeth, how has the participatory movement impacted museums, crowdsourcing and that kind of thing? Or are there good examples of where museums have adopted those strategies? 
Oh, there are fabulous examples of museums that have adopted those strategies. It's hard to even know where to begin. I'll name one of my favorite projects, just because I find it so incredibly powerful and moving, as well as clever. The um, U.S. National Holocaust Museum in D.C. Um, has, of course, tremendously important and, and sad and tragic archives, one of which is from the Lodz Ghetto. And one of the sets, one of the artifacts that they have from the Lodz Ghetto is a yearbook that was signed by thousands of students and presented to um, the chairman, of, the Jewish chairman of the ghetto. So we have this book documenting here are all of these school children who lived and studied in the ghetto at a certain point in time. Almost all of those children were sent to the concentration camps and died. And the museum has said, you know, somewhere hidden in our archives, we know are the other pieces of information that would tell the lives of these children, tell their stories, make them more than just a name. And one of our obligations is to unite those stories with the children's names so that their memories don't die along with them. But we couldn't do this in 100 years. It's just too much work. So what they did is they digitized the memory book, they digitized the documents, and they're recruiting citizen historians to essentially adopt a child and do the research and come through the archives and try and reconstruct that child's story and then work with the museum staff to check and validate their research and then have that become part of the museum's interpretation and the story they tell. So how's that for an incredibly important piece of real work? meaningful work that's being opened up to people uh, so that they can help the museum achieve their core missions. That's touching. Uh, there's a question, I can't tell if it's from Durf or Mark Tozer, but the question is funding. Money is the bottom line in everything we do. How do you see the blending of profit and nonprofit companies? Are there some examples where two separate entities combine to support one another? Hmm. Um, can I ask for clarification on when you say where two separate entities combine to support each other? Do you mean like mergers between different museums? Uh, you know, I didn't, uh, I'll, I'll have to see if that was, okay, it looks like it was Mark's yeah. question. Mark, feel free to raise your hand, Mark, and I can give you the mic, or you can just put your clarification in the chat. Well, while he's clarifying, I'll, I'll, I'll address the first part of the question that I think I was a little clearer on. Um, I think that museums are going to have to open their, their minds a lot more broadly about all the potential financial structures. Frankly, there are a handful of very f successful and high-quality for-profit museums right now. Um, so for example, the International Spy Museum in DC is a for-profit museum. The Museum of Sex in New York, which I have not been to but have been told those are very good exhibits, uh, is a for-profit museum. Um, Biltmore Estate down in North Carolina is one of the most highly attended and successful historic house museums in the U.S. It's a for-profit. So it is not impossible to deliver in a meaningful way on your mission and be a for-profit institution. Now that said, that's only a tiny handful of museums. But on the other hand, I think if you look at for-profit companies, you're seeing more and more of them being run by entrepreneurs who aren't just looking at the bottom line. They have a social mission as well. Look at Ben and Jerry's. They really made a conscious effort both to do good with how they made their product and, and having sustainable, uh, fairly sourced materials for their ice cream, but devoting a percentage of the profits back into social causes that they felt were um, important and worthy of support. Now that's being formally legitimized in the U.S. Uh, as what are called social benefit corporations, L3Cs, are being um, legislatively validated so that you can have a for-profit company that has limits on the amount of profit it can make, has a social good embedded at the core of what it is, and investors who pay into it both know they're going to get some money back. It's not the most profitable form of investment. If they just wanted to get the highest return on investment, they can find something else. But they're going to their triple bottom line. It's not just making their money make more money. It's making their money do a social good that they believe in. And while those institutions are not nonprofits in the sense that they can give people tax write-offs for private donations, because they've incorporated around a, a articulated social good, they are eligible for certain kinds of philanthropic foundation support that they couldn't get otherwise. So I think we're starting to see a blurring of the boundaries and a blending of nonprofit and for-profit business models. 
I think you brilliantly actually addressed the second half of Mark's question. And we are at the top of the hour. And as a courtesy to our guests, we do end on time. So I'm going to clap for you here. I'm hovering over the Thank you very smiley much. face and clicking on applause. We've been talking with Elizabeth Merritt about uh, the future of museums and the future of education. This has been a really fun show, and I love that sort of the expanding of the topic into uh, museums. And I'm really grateful that you've come on the show. Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks you very much for having me, Steve. Really appreciate it. Brian Alexander next Tuesday, Khalid Smith uh, on Thursday. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a great night. And I'm just putting my email up in case anybody has follow-up questions. Gracious of you. Fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. I know you're on East Coast time and you're traveling, so feel free just to log right off. For those of you who are interested, you can uh, go up to File, Save, and you can save the chat. You can also save the chat in the full uh, Black Book Library recording. So if you don't get to it now, you're welcome to do that later. And there was quite a bit of chat. And uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to log off, but uh, we do have to bump everybody out of the room for the recording to process. So w when you're ready, go ahead and click on the X at the top right of your screen and go to File and Exit. And um, Elizabeth put in uh, a Twitter account and the blog address. And it's futureofmuseums.org for the uh, organization as well. That was terrific, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve.